Hello, my name is Pastor Todd Zydema, and I'm the pastor of Hope Christian Reformed Church in Hull, Iowa, and this is the evening video meditation uh, for July the 19th, 2020. For this evening scripture, we're going to be reading from 2 Samuel 11, which is the story of David, Bath David and Bathsheba, and we'll be studying also the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 41. Lord's Day 41 covers uh, the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. So, as we prepare to hear God's word, let's open with prayer. Lord God, as we come before you this evening, we give thanks for your word. And we pray, Lord, that your word will bless us, convict us, and challenge us as we hear it tonight. And as we hear it in the context of your command for us to live holy and chaste lives within the boundaries that you have given to us in your word, we pray that we might hear this command as a way to live gratefully and thankfully for you. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name alone. Amen. 2 Samuel 11, we'll be reading verses 1 through 17 and then uh, skipping a few verses and going to the end of the chapter. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was and how the soldiers were, how the war was going. And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more today, or one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. And so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him. And David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants, and he did not go home. And in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah Hittite, the Hittite died. Then skipping down to verses 26 and 27. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. This is from the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answers 108 and 109. What is God's will for us in the seventh commandment? God condemns all unchastity. We should therefore thoroughly detest it, and married or single live decent and chaste lives. Does God in this commandment forbid only such scandalous sins as adultery? 
We are temples of the Holy Spirit, body and soul, and God wants both to be kept clean and holy. That is why he forbids everything which incites unchastity, whether it be actions, looks, talk, thoughts, or desires. This is the story that everyone knows, but it makes us uncomfortable. You see, we, were, want, we want to remember David as the man uh, who would become king and the man after God's own heart. We want to remember David as the innocent boy who with only a sling and stones uh, killed the mighty giant Goliath, defending his people Israel as well as the honor of God. We want to remember him as the, the great king who would be the descendant, the ancestor of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. We don't want to remember him as a person in power who took advantage of his authority in order to satisfy his desires. When we talk about the seventh commandment, it gets uncomfortable for us as well. It might be easier to hear about sins or temptations to sin if we apply it to somebody else's problem, somebody else's temptation. You see, we like to keep our own sins, our own temptations hidden and well covered. When we read about the story of David and Bathsheba, most of us would be content if we would read the seventh commandment and call that enough. We know that we should not commit adultery. Maybe we would pair that along with Jesus' words in Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We live in a world that's saturated with the breaking of the seventh commandment. On television, the shows that we watch uh, on our screens, people change partners as quickly as they change clothes or out of their clothes. The expectation, not the exception, is that a man and a woman must be intimate uh, before marriage or that living together so that they can just try things out. That's practical advice in the ways of our world. In our screens, on our advertisements, the shows we watch, lust is more than that. It can be something as simple as the catechism said, a look that lingers just a little bit too long. Following through on an impulse, whether you are by yourself or with a partner. The world around us seems to be telling us and teaching us that lust is something that is just a part of who we are. It's natural and we should just follow along with it. It's not wrong, it's nature. As Christians, if we believe that God has different expectations for us, better expectations for us, doesn't it seem logical that we would want to hear God's word and hear what he has to teach us? The first thing that we need to remember is that our sexuality and the expression of it within the proper bounds of a married relationship between a man and a woman is a gift from God. But that good gift has been affected by sin. Looking at the text, we read this biblical story of the consequences of lust and breaking the seventh commandment. For David, it was a look that lingered too long. Lust that was acted upon. As with the other commandments, one broken commandment often leads to other broken commandments. The law, the, the commands broken of, of coveting, of lying, of committing murder. In this story, the focus is on David. Some have tried to read things into the text that just aren't there, like Bathsheba enticed David. The text doesn't say anything 
of the like. The clear reading of this text is that David abused his power. He knew better, and he compromised himself as well as Bathsheba. He broke his vows to God as well as interrupted a married relationship. We're not given a reason why David did this other than sin. Now for me, this text, oddly enough, is one more sign of an affirmation of the inspiration of Scripture. David, up to this point, is idolized in Scripture. Now, it would seem to be that someone who was going to be an heir, uh, an ancestor or relative of the Messiah, that they would be recorded as having a perfect reputation. Instead, in the text, we see David's failings, and we recognize that he needed salvation as well. Now, instead of hiding this event away and never saying anything more about it, the writer wants us to focus on David and his failure. David is the sinner. David acted out on his lustful feelings. He lied and he caused others to lie. And he may not have swung the sword that killed Uriah, but in a cold-hearted move, he made Uriah carry to Joab what was essentially Uriah's letter of execution. David was a murderer. The desire for physical intimacy is a desire that God created in every person. Um, God, in his wisdom, tells us, as I mentioned before, that the best expression of that desire is within a committed relationship, within the boundaries of a married relationship between a man and a woman. Now, we might rationalize for ourselves other types of relationships, but let's not use Scripture for our justification. The biblical pattern is consistent. The big, biblical witness uh, is consistent as well. The problem occurs when our pride and our sin takes our God-given desires and, and turns them into lust. And what we end up is where we try to convince ourselves that we don't need to be committed to anyone or anything except to ourselves into our desires. So we create terms like hooking up in our contemporary language, where there is no commitment other than each person having the desire to get what they want out of the relationship for short-term gratification. There's not even a discussion about commitment. Now in this 21st century world in which we live, um, we don't have to go to a street corner we don't have to go to some seedy bar or shop. We don't even have to leave home anymore. We just need an internet connection to satisfy whatever our desires are. Our screens can be filled with images or videos that prey on our desires, but hide the fact that the people that we see are real people, real stories, and in a very tragic way, we forget that these people are created in the image of God, that they have their own lives, but yet we use them as objects and things, and we in some ways throw them away as easy it is to turn off the screen and forget that they exist. These people are someone's daughter, someone's son, we need to remember that they were created in the image of God. Now, what happened to David? He lost perspective, and he gave in to the idolatry of self. He abused his power, uh, but there were consequences. He not only spoiled Bathsheba's relationship with her husband, uh, but she, now she was pregnant with a child. And what was David's impulse to do? not a, to own up to his sin. It was to lie, to cover it up. And you have to admit that David's plan was pretty clever. Call in Uriah from the battlefield. 
have the expectation that Uriah, being glad to be home, would, would come home to his wife and enjoy uh, the benefits and the pleasures of his married relationship. This would give legitimacy to Bathsheba's pregnancy. There were no medical tests to prove paternity. It's interesting that in this story that Uriah is shown to be the only one with honor. His loyal to David is, is tragically the cause of his own death. It isn't the arrows of the enemy. Uriah insists that while his fellow soldiers are out on the battlefield in the camps, that he won't go home. David gets Uriah drunk, but instead of going home, Uriah sleeps on a mat with the other slaves and servants of David. Now, as with most lies, it becomes harder and more difficult to cover up, and lies have to be told upon lies. And eventually it leads to David being a murderer. And David may not have held the sword or shot the arrow that led to Uriah's death, but he was complicit in the murder. He commanded Joab, his general, to leave Uriah exposed and vulnerable so that he would certainly be killed. And David's sin will continue to bear consequences as we read later. We know that in our lives, our sin, when left to itself, has consequences as well. Ultimately, whether we consider it or not, lust or adultery, those sins are a form of selfishness or pride that either consciously or unconsciously says, God, you aren't enough to satisfy. You aren't good enough. It is idolatry because we're not patient enough or we convince ourselves we're going to do what we want to do because for right now it makes me happy. When left unchecked, it's not just about us hurting ourselves, but we hurt others as well. Sin affects every part of our relationship. And there's not many of us, if there are any at all, who can say that our lives have not been affected in one way or another through adultery or infidelity. It affects our marriages, our families, our work, our friendships, our community, our churches, and so on. We recognize sin and what it does to us in this life. But as with all things, God desires to bring our actions, including our physical desires, in line with his pattern and guide for life. We need to surrender to God. So what are some of the things that we need to do to bring our lives, uh, the use of our bodies, in line with how God wants us to live? First, let us simply acknowledge and be thankful that God created us with physical desires. To deny this or think that our physical desires are wrong is to say that God made a mistake. We don't believe that. If there is a mistake, it is not God's error. It is our sinful expression of the good thing that God created good and holy. The desire that God creates in us, as I mentioned earlier, is best expressed in the, cousin, in the commitment between husband and wife, man and woman. So the thing that we can do, the best thing that we can do is encourage strong marriages where husbands and wives are both seeking to help their spouse develop and grow in all areas of their lives. We are tempted to give in, to, to short-circuit, longer-lasting joy by seeking what will only temporarily uh, satisfy in the short term. Secondly, let's combat sin together. When we live together in relationship, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, let's walk with each other. 
Let's combat sin by holding each other accountable as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let us find friends in Christ whom we can share uh, the things that we struggle with, to let people into our lives to pray for us, to hold us accountable, to have people who will speak to us truth, but also with grace, rooted in Christ-like love. Finally, let's understand that Satan's most effective strategy is to isolate us in shame. He uses our guilt, which rightly tells us where we've sinned, but magnifies it and twists it so we hold on to not only the guilt, but so that it turns into shame. Where we've convinced ourselves that we have done something so terrible, so shameful, that we can never be forgiven of it. Or we are so bound by shame that we believe that we have to hide in lies and not let anyone else know. Let us be honest and truthful with each other, knowing that while we acknowledge our sins, in that sin, things might never be the same. Know that there might be a hope and a promise that things might be better because we are able to live freely with the truth. Freely and truthfully with God and with others. And that we can start living the life that God wants us to live and live it out in a way in our relationship that honors Him. That we don't have to live in darkness and in lies. We are created in the image of God. This matters in the way that we talk with each other, how we look at each other. It matters how we use our bodies. Uh, as the Catechism mentions and summarizes or paraphrases 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We are part of the body of Christ. Now in your relationships, remember your own body. Let us be honest with ourselves, with one another, and most importantly, be honest before God. And let us live in truth and grace, glorifying God in the relationships that He gives to us, glorifying God in the way that we use our bodies, knowing that we are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Let us give thanks to God for the good gifts that He gives to us and the good expressions in which we can live out those good things. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. Lead us and guide us by it. And Lord, may we honor and glorify You through our relationships to one another. Help us to use our bodies in a way that honors and glorifies you as well. Lord, we thank, we're thankful that even when there are times where we fall short, that we can find forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ, and we can find fullness and wholeness in you. We're thankful that you love us, Lord, uh, with a love greater than what we can imagine. May we live in that love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. It's good to see you this week, and we'll look forward to talking again soon. The Lord bless you and keep you, and have a great week.